Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar, The Future of Hemp Regulations, Preparing Your Company with Current Dietary Supplement Guidelines. I'm Vanessa Snyder, Business Development Director for Eurofins Hemp and Botanicals, and it's my pleasure to be moderating this webinar. Today, I am joined by our wonderful presenters, Lauren Israelson, UNPA President, Marielle Weintraub, President of the U.S. Hemp Authority and Director of Scientific Research and Development for Zalis, and Lukasz Baklovic, Senior Staff Scientist and Technical Manager at Eurofins Food Integrity and Innovation. We appreciate your participation today. And with that being said, Lauren, you may begin your presentation. Thank you, Vanessa, and good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be a part of this uh, program uh, to discuss a very topical, very important and relevant issue, which is the current state of CBD hemp extracts their regulatory and legislative status. So with that, let me begin. We'll do so. With a little disclaimer that um, the first thing is that uh, the, the critical date that I want to start with is May of 2019. This is when FDA called a public meeting to receive comments with regard to a specific set of questions, which I will show you in a moment, and to receive public comments. FDA received about 4,400 comments, and the most important ones you can see on the image on this screen. We went through every single comment, marked them up, and out of that developed a 275-page uh, PowerPoint presentation, which I'm happy to share with any of our attendees today that really goes through what everybody thought then in terms of how should the FDA regulate hemp CBD or other cannabinoids. There's a great deal of learning to be had through these comments, which is why I've used this as a, uh, I would say, a template of how we're going to proceed this morning and how I'd like to walk you through where we are now. But first, let me just say, as we have seen over the past uh, three or four years, how CBD hemp extracts have exploded in the marketplace. And yet, FDA continues to say that these are not lawfully sold products. The problem began uh, because cannabis, now as we know it, hemp, which is cannabis uh, with a amount of THC at less than 0.3%, um, is a lawful agricultural material because of the 2018 Farm Bill. The problem is that Congress didn't complete the process by also making hemp extracts lawful as finished products. This is the problem that we're trying to solve. So let me take you through first these comments. And this is the link that you can go to to see all the details. And it's important that you understand these questions. And I decided to put them into, into the presentation and scroll through these very quickly because they really relate to the core issues that FDA is concerned about. Number one is safety. Uh, what do we need to know about the safety of these products? For example, so what levels of, of cannabis um, and other uh, cannabinoids or other compounds uh, would cause safety concerns? Uh, they're trying to think through all sources and all uses of cannabis and hemp extracts. And as you can see, ingestion, absorption, inhalation, people are using uh, cannabis and hemp products for a range of things, topicals included. So how does FDA go about collecting the information they believe they need to understand what a to total daily dosage would be of the relevant uh, chemistry here? We're interested in the cannabinoids and uh, not THC. Also, uh, they're quite rightly asking, are there special populations we should think about? And I would note that in two days, there will be an all day FDA uh, conference uh, of experts to discuss um, sex and gender related issues in terms of cannabinoids and effects on humans. So FDA is, is literally making good on their desire to investigate these questions. This is an important one as we consider uh, if you give uh, hemp extracts to children, uh, to pregnant or lactating women or to animals. And as uh, you may well know, 
that uh, hemp extract CBD use uh, in companion animals is a very big business. So FDA has expanded their scope of interest to not just humans, but also pets. Also, what about the collection of safety information at the state level? Uh, as you well know, one of the complicating factors is that we have multiple layers of regulation. Who's in charge of this product category? So we have a federal level issue, but within that we have multiple agencies, all of whom have ju uh, jurisdiction in, in one way or another. The states, as well as municipalities, also, uh, it truly is a maze of regulations. It's uh, incredibly difficult to understand day to day what's going on. So collection systems of information is something FDA would like to know about. And there were a number of comments that describe different systems that I didn't know existed that were specific to the collection of information um, about uh, cannabinoid related products. The key issue, once again, is how do you understand what a therapeutic dose is and find what the subtherapeutic dose is that would fall within the definitional um, jurisdiction of dietary supplements, let alone food. And how do you decide and understand what an acceptable daily intake is? Now, the problem here is you have to consider all sources. That would be topical, um, potentially inhalation, food sources, cosmetic sources, and then make a determination of what is the average consumption <clears throat> pattern, excuse me. So FDA continues to work on that question. And also how do you understand and develop uh, margins of safety and exposure? And this gets to the fundamental question, which is a central one right now is what about foods? Can or should, um, hemp extracts or CBD really go into foods and then into the food supply. The current view at FDA is no. Uh, it's as simple as that because they really feel that they can't quantify what that number would be. With food labeling, there is no provision for cautionary language or upper limits on dosage, unlike dietary supplements where that is possible. Residues coming out of food animals, this is a bit of an odd question, is that meat, milk, eggs, this anticipates that, um, that feed animals would be somehow getting cannabis into their diet uh, or hemp uh, at some point. I think hemp is an industrial product, agricultural product. Yes, it's important. Um, this is not something we consider, nor are we spending any time on. And again, they're talking about, and this question is, what happens if you have commercially available food or supplement products? How does that cause disincentives for drug development research? This is really at the heart of the issue right now. Later in the presentation, I'll introduce you to an organization that is focused exclusively on this issue. And that's a repeat of that same question. So now let me turn uh, your attention to GW Pharmaceuticals. They were founded in 1998. They are the, the company that developed and received approval for Epidiolex. So this created the fundamental problem is that once cannabis had become a lawful agricultural material as, a, as hemp, um, that's great. But at the same time, and this is incredible how you can't plan these things, is that GW received drug approval for CBD, one of the important cannabinoids. So that triggered what is called the exclusionary provision. It goes like this, that under Deshaies, uh, there is a provision to try and determine when a, a substance uh, either became a dietary ingredient or a drug. And this is often called the race to market provision. Well, because CBD is still not a lawful dietary ingredient, that we don't have a start date of when it is a lawful ingredient. Therefore, when Epidiolex became an approved drug, they won the race to market provision. That is the current FDA view. Consequently, it would take either FDA action by administrative action, um, which would be rulemaking, or if Congress chose to intervene and determine that CBD or hemp extracts and all other cannabinoids are lawful ingredients, there is a provision in Deshaies for that to happen. That's where we are today, is trying to decide who will make the decision 
whether or not CBD, hemp extracts, et cetera, uh, would be lawful ingredients, and if so, by what mechanism, FDA action or legislation? So what we've seen now in the past few months is that legislation is seen by the industry and a number of members of Congress as the preferred avenue. Two bills have been introduced, 58, 5587, and perhaps the more significant bill now is 8179. Uh, here's where we stand politically. As you know, we've just gone through a, uh, a very uh, important, if not difficult, election. The Congress has returned uh, to a lame duck session as of yesterday. So in principle, this bill, H.R. 8179, if there was sufficient interest, could advance and pass. Uh, we would love that. We would think that that would be the resolution of the question and allow the industry to proceed. This bill simply says that co constituents of the hemp plant would be recognized as lawful dietary ingredients and would be subject to safety review by FDA through an NDI or other appropriate mechanisms. Uh, this bill is not supported by the FDA. It currently has about 30 co-sponsors. However, here's the problem, is that given the incredibly complex and busy schedule that Congress has in the midst of a pandemic, dealing with transitions of government, um, a number of members of Congress that will be leaving new members that are waiting to come and other uh, national priorities, we think it's unlikely that H.R. Um, 8179 will pass this year. So now what? So if we don't have resolution through FDA because they have not started any formal rulemaking process to make CBD hemp extracts lawful, and if we don't see a legislative solution this year, where do we go? What happens now? So let me give you a halftime score. The way I see it, FDA scored 17 points and the CBD industry six. Why do I say that? Well, it was FDA's goals was to, to create an expert um, advisory task force internally. All parts of FDA are involved. Uh, they have been very active, very busy, have met with many, many uh, groups and organizations to receive input and advice. But part of this process has been very slow. And we feel that this was probably both by design and also by the nature of the workload involved. So they felt it was in their interest to take this slow, be very cautious, uh, try to gather as much information as possible before making an epic decision. What do we do with CBD? It's already approved as a drug. Do we go ahead and allow the product to continue to be in the consumer marketplace? The concern FDA has, obviously, is how would they pull CBD out of the market? That would cause such a strong consumer reaction that that would no doubt trigger a congressional response. Um, the CBD hemp industry, for its part, has certainly been advancing work with regard to understanding safety. A number of initiatives have been involved to better understand uh, the uh, chemistry, the analytical requirements to test uh, as well as certification standards. So we have been working very hard, certainly in the trade association community, we have been working for many, many months now developing ideas and concepts that could be realized as legislative language. And yet here we are, um, our major, major problem is time. We're simply running out of time that many in the, the CBD industry are stressed financially. And we're going into a period now where it doesn't appear that uh, legislation could be introduced or seriously considered until spring of next year. So uh, now we have to look at this extraordinary situation of a runoff election in Georgia where two Senate seats uh, will be determined on January 5. That will determine the control of the Senate and that in turn will control the interest and the likelihood of reintroduction of legislation. So here are the options that if the Republicans control the Senate, that Richard Burr from North Carolina would be the chairman of the Senate HELP committee, Health, Education, Labor, Pensions. If the Democrats are in control of the Senate, it would be Patty Murray from Washington State. The question is, as the chairman of the committee or chairwoman of the committee is, how motivated would they be to advance this legislation and their support would be vital. In the House, the key player 
um, is the chairman of the House Energy and Commerce Committee. That would be Frank Pallone. Uh, he has indicated his support for legislation. And yet we anticipate going into next year, the key issue will be, will the administration support legislation under President Biden? We think that that is likely. However, what is the priority level of our issues relative to everything else that the new administration will have to deal with? So, as I've noted, lame duck session, chances of legislation not so great. Spring is a realistic target. What do we do now? Uh, how can we productively uh, use our time to try and, and help our um, circumstances? So first, as I've mentioned, this is the Federal Register notice regarding the November 19 meeting uh, that will discuss uh, gender and, and I would say uh, special population related issues regarding safety and cannabinoids. Uh, it is still possible to register. Uh, anyone can do so. Um, if you uh, take a look at the, these uh, documents afterwards, feel free to register and sign up and have someone on your staff and your company listen in. This is an expert advisory meeting. They will not be receiving, to my knowledge, public comments. So, uh, as I wrap up, let me introduce you to the Collaborative for CBD Safety, uh, sorry, Science and Safety. This is a group that has been funded by GW Pharma, and its uh, membership is, is open generally to interested parties. Um, and here you can see who are the players involved. <clears throat> I would point out of interest, uh, here is uh, GW Pharma. The National Consumers League has been very active. Legit Script is an organization that you may have heard of. They're becoming increasingly important as a player because they control, they advise Amazon, Google, others with regard to security of the financial transactions that we all use when we're purchasing products or services online. Um, also, uh, UNPA, our organization, has been involved and is a participant, and you can see uh, these various entities. Now, collectively, the work of this organization is designed to establish both priorities in developing safety and science. What they're currently working on is a legislative template. What I can share is that the template that's been designed by this group is largely, I would say, antithetical to the current legislation proposed in Congress. So this means next spring that various organizations will once again meet on Capitol Hill. We anticipate we'll still be in the middle of a pandemic to try to work out our differences. So the parties will be members of Congress, all of the industry participants, various organizations. We think CCSS will be a key one. Um, a lot of the hemp and agriculture associations and interests will be represented as well. So what are the goals? We simply want lawful status for all constituents of the hemp plant. That's a big ask. And we know that the pharmaceutical industry does not share that view. They believe that every time that a new cannabinoid is being developed as a dietary ingredient, that it's less incentive for them to develop that into a drug. We also want FDA to recognize a lawful pathway for NDI notification. Here's what we, we need to work out. Uh, what do we do with food and beverages? This is an open issue. There is not yet agreement. As I mentioned, the concern on FDA side is we can't calculate how much CBD or other cannabinoids are present in the food supply. It's simply, at this point, not realistic to understand that. Also, what about other ways to determine safety? That could be grass affirmation, food additive uh, petitions. That is also yet to be determined. It's very hard to predict the future right now uh, for hemp CBD products because of all of the uncertainties and all of the unknowns. Um, I do not remember a time in my professional career in this industry, which is 40 years, of an, an issue as important as the future of hemp CBD um, and we're working, I would say 50% of our time is devoted to this issue. So here's what we need to do. As now is the time to reach out to the hemp farming community, actively engage with the new administration, the new Congress to re-educate all of these new players. And that will include an HHS and FDA as well. Prepare for a grassroots community to uh, talk to their new members of Congress as well as to continue to advance our technical and quality competence, which 
Mariel will speak about in just a moment. So here we are, here's the key takeaways, is that we believe that the regulatory pathway is legislation. We're not sure that FDA can do this in time that meets the needs of industry, which as I've mentioned is uh, financially uh, struggling. And we want to help overcome that problem by making hemp CBD products lawful, uh, taking into consideration all of the key uh, safety concerns that have been expressed. The pharma industry is gaining strength, clarity, purpose, and message. We have to be aware that they are a, um, a very competent opponent, if you will, and that we will meet them in Congress next year. Time is not our friend. We need to move quickly. So the earlier that we can push forward in early 2021, the better, but we simply have to wait to see what the composition of Congress and the government looks like. We've come so far, this is one of the most important issues. And I think to our natural healthcare consumers, hemp extract and CBD products are in their minds, one of the most important and promising products that they have ever seen come out of our industry. We all would like to enjoy the benefits of that and make those, those products available safely, properly labeled, and to have opportunities for further research. So that's it, my friends. It's a very difficult, complicated subject. Um, and we'll try to keep you advised and updated of developments along the way. My thanks to Eurofins for allowing me to participate in this session today. And so with that, I will say thank you once again and hand the program over to Mariel and to Vanessa. Thank you so much, Lauren. We appreciate the information and your insights. Mariel, you may go ahead and present. Excellent, thank you. So I am Dr. Mariel Weintraub. Um, I am a president of the U.S. Hemp Authority. It is our certification program for hemp products. Um, and as that is a nonprofit, I am also the director of scientific research and development for a hemp company uh, here in Texas. Um, I was not sure um, who all knew a ton about hemp who'd be on the webinar today. So I did want to do a quick 101, um, just in case there are some new people in the room, which there uh, constantly tends to be. Um, so for a lot of people, uh, the hemp industry appeared out of nowhere. So some thought it would be immediately squashed by the FDA and other thought, others thought it would just be a passing fad. Um, when this all really started, it was back in 2014 with the Agriculture Improvement Act, uh, which is also known as the Farm Bill. Um, and this allowed uh, states to regulate uh, hemp research and market research regarding hemp-derived products. Um, and that's when we saw the birth of groups like uh, Elixinol and Charlotte's Web, uh, CD Sciences, those groups. Um, at the same time, we then, four years later, saw the 2018 Farm Bill um, put even more protections in for uh, hemp farmers, um, as well as uh, things like crossing state lines with hemp. Uh, most importantly, it removed um, from, the from the definition of marijuana in the Controlled Substances Act, it removed the definition of hemp. Um, so hemp was no longer considered a controlled substance. And the way the wording puts it is any extract or any cannabinoid from hemp is no longer um, under the Controlled Substances Act. Um, the issue we're facing now is that although we do have um, the 2018 Farm Bill, we have more information from USDA than we did before, we still have a ton of confusing regulations out there um, as Lauren was talking about right before this presentation. Uh, and what makes it even a little worse is that these confusing regulations are constantly evolving. Um, so we have a constant change in the regulations we're trying to follow as hemp companies. And then we have the constant fight of the federal regulations versus state or tribal regulations. What we did see following the 2018 Farm Bill is a huge shift in the market where CBD became a lot more mainstream, uh, a lot more recognizable, a lot more acceptance around CBD products. We saw big box stores begin to carry um, a lot of topicals such as CVS and Walgreens. We also saw a lot of cosmetics go into groups like Sephora uh, and Ulta. 
um, as well as dietary supplements uh, into groups like Vitamin Shop and GNC. Um, we also have begun to see food and beverage giants uh, enter this space. We saw Big Beer enter this space, um, and I'm excited to see who continues to, to join the CBD industry or the hemp industry. But what we're also contending with uh, are, are regulations, not just from FDA, we have regulations for USDA. Um, and they rolled out uh, an interim final rule that very specifically mentioned when hemp needed to be um, collected before harvest, tested, and then harvested within a certain amount of time. This put a great strain or will be putting a great strain on the farmers and the testing labs. And so what we did is um, what, what USDA did was open up a time for public comments, which I think was very, very important, um, not only for this one specific reason, um, for, for a lot of others, such as requiring labs to be um, schedule one DEA labs, which goes completely in the face of why uh, the USDA and why the Farm Bill was created. Um, but we were luckily, based on our comments, able to get an extension on this IFR uh, or on the programs. And so we're, the hemp farmers are allowed to be using the 2014 program until the end of September of 2021. We are trying to push that out even further um, while we do work out some of these little nuances that, that maybe people who aren't farmers aren't recognizing the need for. Uh, at the same time, we got surprised by the DEA, who also decided they wanted to jump back in uh, in the hemp world uh, with their IFR. Um, they had their public comment period close uh, in October, uh, mid-October. Um, and it's because the DEA believes that THC uh, content that exceeds 0.3% at any point should then be under their jurisdiction even if the product being made was being made from legally grown hemp that had a dry weight, the THC was not greater than 0.3%, which is the definition in the farm bill. Um, the issue here with that is the DEA is either doing it on purpose or not considering science uh, because during extraction process, the processors will have THC level go above 0.3%, but before the product is sold to consumers, um, it will then be back down below the 0.3% at legal uh, limits. So it does make it a bit confusing right now for the processors about what they're supposed to do while they're processing and whether or not they are going to be in trouble for creating products where this is when you extract something, you compound it. There's no way around it. Um, and so as a result, we're trying to figure out, uh, um, I know a bunch of us got together a bunch of the trade associations, the hemp trade associations, even the dietary supplement associations who were there to support us. Um, and uh, it turns out that the DEA has received over 3,000 comments um, during their comment period. So we're waiting to hear where that particular um, regulation is going. So it gets even more confusing, uh, which Lauren very well pointed out about a lack of clarity from the FDA. Um, so you'll see that there are warning letters uh, that hemp companies have gotten, but what's very, very interesting is the wording that's being used. Um, for the most part, the FDA was easily able to go after what I refer to as low-hanging fruit, so those companies that are using disease claims and know they should not be. Um, and so those are the warning letters that are going out, that and for having pet products. But what makes it complicated is I don't actually know of anyone who's gotten an inspection, and I think it's because they don't actually have anything to inspect against. Um, which is a problem for those of us who want to be compliant with FDA. Um, it's also allowing some bad players to exist right now. And what we're worried about is what uh, Larissa Pavlik from UNPA refers to as a 60 minutes moment, where one group brings down the entire industry. Um, so those of us in the industry that are concerned with our products, concerned with the quality, concerned for our consumers, we don't want bad players in this industry. We want FDA involved. Um, what's really interesting, though, is how slow um, they've been moving and uh, how much more complicated it gets for us because of that. So we've seen changes in their FAQs online. We've seen a change to their, uh, their drug approval norms. So they fast-tracked what looks like different CBD isolate, gave uh, different CBD isolate 
pharmaceuticals a way to fast track onto the market. But then we also have quotes uh, from Commissioner Stephen Hahn like, so we know one thing from the American people, they're using CBD products. We're not going to be able to say you can't use these products. And even if we did, it's a fool's game to even try to approach that. So we are kind of getting different signals from different groups um, all within, or different people all within the FDA. So the question I get a lot is, are there any regulations at all? Um, so if we're talking about how great the federal regulations are, what are hemp companies doing to follow regulations and which regulations are they actually following? So what you'll notice uh, is across the United States, there is now a patchwork of different uh, state and tribal regulations. We have different labeling rules. We have different testing rules. We have different warnings. For those of you in food, it's very similar to being a part of a, like a California's Prop 65 if you put that program on steroids. So depending on where you are, you either can call your dietary supplement a dietary supplement, or it might be, have to be called a hemp supplement because they don't want it called a dietary supplement. At the same time, one group wants a warning about a uh, product containing over 0.3% THC, and the other not containing over 0.3% THC, and the other group wants you to actually spell out THC, which all of us know on labels, we don't have a ton of room, and we have to decide based on the states we're selling in, what warnings we need to use, what testing needs to be done, what labeling needs to be done. And keep in mind, that's all on top of FDA CFR 111, 117, or rules for cosmetics. Because what we're trying to do is make quality products, have quality assurance, be compliant. So we are taking into account FDA's current food and dietary supplement regulations, while also having to include all these various state regulations as well. So what do we have right now? Um, so we have a, a reports of mislabeled products. There's some bit, there have been some um, journal articles um, printed about how some of the products don't list the right amount of CBD or how they're not calling or paying attention to heavy metals. We have a serious FDA lack of clarity um, in addition to that, we also have consumers who want to have, be more confident in their products, be able to trust their products, and we have retailers who want to sell these products, but want to be able to trust the products they're selling as well. So back in 2018, uh, actually at the end of 2017, beginning of 2018, um, a large group of us from the U.S. Hemp Roundtable um, decided that our group the hemp industry needed uh, to start self-regulating uh, because if we waited for FDA, we'd be waiting for a very long time. Um, and what we wanted to make sure was that hemp companies that were making products were um, able to be identified as making quality assured products, having regulations to follow. We want people to look at hemp products and be able to see who's telling the truth on their labels who is being transparent with the products they're using, the uh, processing techniques they're using, and even where they're growing hemp. Um, we believe the 2018 Farm Bill was developed for uh, US farmers. Um, and so we wanna make sure that people know where hemp is being grown uh, when they're buying their products. We had a pretty amazing year in 2019. So we had a couple program highlights First of all, our first 13 companies were certified in March of 2019. And by the end of 2019, we had certified over 60 companies and farms. Uh, we also started developing Guidance Plan 2.0. Uh, and the reason we are doing this is because the hemp industry is still young and it is still constantly evolving. And we do need to be able to um, move with the times. Uh, at the same time, uh, I think one of my most proud moments was when Prevention Magazine listed the U.S. Hemp Authority certification in the top 10 2019 health breakthrough um, breakthroughs of uh, the year, um, which is pretty incredible, but also shows you the importance behind people wanting an easy way to identify products that they can easily trust. Um, so you guys know there were some big changes between our original guidance and 2.0. Um, some of the most notables is the fact that we added a glossary. 
there is uh, a lot of terminology in the hemp industry and not everyone uses it the same way. So we decided the first thing we needed was a glossary so everyone was speaking the same language. We wanted to make sure everyone knew the difference between bioengineered or genetically engineered. Uh, USDA has a um, definition, FDA has a definition, um, and we wanted to make sure that people understood what we meant um, because what you'll notice later is that we are not allowing genetically engineered hemp in the program. Uh, we also wanted to define cannabimimetic, um, and we also wanted to define broad-spectrum extract versus full-spectrum extract versus isolate. So when someone saw a label for the U.S. Hemp Authority certification logo or certification seal, they would know that they would be able to trust if it said broad-spectrum, that it was broad-spectrum and what that was, or if it was full-spectrum, what that was. Um, we also, as I mentioned, um, don't allow genetically engineered hemp in the program. We also do not allow mimetics or synthetics uh, cannabinoids in the program. So it's very important, especially as uh, a lot of us do consider ourselves part of the dietary supplement industry. Um, and I think this is going to become a big point of contention uh, very, very soon. Um, and we must label uh, the country of origin that the hemp was grown in. Um, we are not saying that hemp from other countries is bad. What we want people to have the ability to do is look at a label, look at a product. The product be transparent and the, the, the consumer pick the product that is best for them. So what we really needed to do here um, in our certification was have a way for people to recognize what uh, the truth and labeling meant. What, why transparency was important and why these products could be trusted. So the first thing we did was develop a group of testing, um, manda uh, mandatory testing guidances. And so we have testing for soil parameters. We want the farmers testing heavy metals, pesticide residues, and the nutrient soil because hemp is a phytoremediator or bioremediator. So where you plant it matters. It will pull things out of the ground. Uh, it has been planted in Chernobyl to pull radiation out of the ground. Um, and some people are asking us why we would make farmers pay for this. Well, it's very, very simple. There are very specific regulations in what can and cannot be in hemp finished product. And so it matters what's in the starting product. And we didn't want farmers to start growing in areas where they would produce a, a, a plant that they could then not sell. Um, we also want people to, and they have to, um, show testing of cannabinoids, uh, CBD, or whichever other cannabinoid they are marketing, as well as uh, THC and terpenes. And final products, we uh, are showing people to test heavy metals, pesticides, microbio uh, microbiology, mycotoxins, and residual solvents. And this is based on a state uh, uh, patchwork of regulations where some states require some testing, other states require other testing, and based on safety um, and risk is why we're asking people to test for very specific contaminants. And so not only are we suggesting the testing, we are also uh, making sure that people are creating uh, sampling and testing plans. So they must implement sampling and testing plans uh, for hemp and hemp derivatives uh, in a manner that is statistically significant. Um, and they also must specify their sampling procedures and have standard operating procedures. We also are letting people know that the laboratories that are being used must be accredited for ISO 17025 for specific test methods or have a proficiency testing for specific testing required. Um, you would be surprised how many people don't realize that the ISO 17025 is not laboratory specific, it's test method specific. And just because a lab is ISO certified to test water doesn't mean they should be testing your cannabinoids. Uh, we also are calling out very specific test methods or at least showing where the testing method uh, validity and reliability need to be in order to be considered a fit for purpose method. 
So for instance, we know that when there is an issue on the market and FDA needs a tiebreaker, they tend to use AOAC methods to do testing. So as soon as there are AOAC methods available to us, and there are now, we picked those to put into our uh, guidance plan. So what we uh, want to make sure people recognize is that there is an AOAC official method of analysis, first action 2018.11, um, or uh, if they're going to use a different method, we want them to at least measure up to what AOAC would consider um, a fit for purpose method. Uh, that also can be found when we're looking at contaminants, so heavy metals uh, and residual solvents. We do draw people, we, we point people towards the OFA guidance, which is free and online, to see what type of levels based on their products um, may or may not be acceptable. We also push them towards Proposition 65 so that they can be compliant in the state of California. Uh, for residual solvents, we are um, recommending people either use USP467 um, or otherwise they can check the, the California Bureau of Cannabis Control to see what levels and limits are allowed for different residual solvents. Um, and we are also continuing to do that for things like pesticides, mycotoxins, and micro. So we want to draw people's attention to the official methods when they exist, for instance, AOAC official methods. Um, we also want to make sure people know the difference between using, let's say, an FDA method for micro uh, versus a USP specifically designed for dietary supplements. And so what we're doing is including all of this in our guidance plan that's free and online. Um, and if people are interested, then they go through the certification, which is conducted by a third party independent auditor. Um, what this is allowing us to do is really continuing to push the truth and transparency, um, uh, the truth and labeling and transparency of products that we are most interested in, in being able to deliver reliable um, and trusted products to the hemp industry uh, and, to hemp, uh, and to hemp consumers. So we are now working on guidance plan 3.0 because as I said before, hemp is ever evolving. Uh, and so in order to keep pace with our rapid change, we did start working on 3.0. So we had a open public comment period from September to October. Uh, it just closed on October 15th. And right now our technical committee is compiling those comments and will re-release 3.0 for a second public comment period. Um, I would love as many people to be involved in commenting as possible. Uh, hemp industry, dietary supplement industry, food, beverage, whoever wants to comment. Um, if you visit www.ushempauthority.org, when uh, 3.0 is up there, there will be a, um, an announcement and also a banner at the top where you can click read the guidance procedures and comment. Um, based on your knowledge, your expertise, and really help us grow this program. We have um, very much uh, increased our level of expertise um, throughout the years and since we started. We made sure that on our board um, we have people who are ex-DEA, ex-FDA, um, we have an ex-Ag Commissioner, um, and so we really, we have farmers, we have dietary supplements, we have experts in contaminants, and that goes to our technical committee as well, where we very specifically um, I'll ask people to apply uh, and very specifically choose people from different areas um, and different links in the supply chain to make sure that we really are covering all of our bases as we develop these uh, guidance plans and procedures for the hemp industry, by the hemp industry, but also makes sense. Um, and we want to be able to continue to do that. So I do ask um, if anyone on this call is willing to comment, um, this will be on the website shortly. There will be LinkedIn announcements, Facebook announcements, um, and I look forward to seeing comments um, from those of you on this call. So thank you very much. Vanessa, back to you. Wonderful, Marielle. Thanks for sharing your perspectives. Next up, we have Lukas. You may go ahead and present. Uh, 
Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, in my presentation, I'll provide a brief overview of analytes that are relevant to testing of hemp and hemp-based products. And I'll talk about some of the challenges uh, that are encountered in this area. I'll also touch on important topics such as validation of test methods and accreditation of testing laboratories. Here's an overview of relevant target analytes. Uh, as we heard already in previous presentation, besides cannabinoids and terpenes, this list also contains residual solvents, uh, pesticide residues, mycotoxins, heavy metals, and microbial pathogens. Uh, there's a number of challenges faced by the testing laboratories in this field. Um, some of the challenges are technical, while the other relate to the nature of the market. Hemp plant material and uh, hemp-based products in particular represent relatively difficult samples to analyze with regard to the complexity of these materials. Uh, additionally, new types of CBD products are being developed and introduced to the market, so the testing methods need to perform appropriately in a wide range of samples. Uh, the major problem is limited availability of standardized and thoroughly validated methods that could be directly adopted by testing laboratories, as well as certified reference materials that can be employed in the validation of these methods. Uh, the test price expectations and uh, competition require laboratories to use effective and high throughput workflows, allowing to cut down the cost and deliver results of time. And finally, uh, there are some challenges that relate to uh, varying local regulations and logistics, especially when uh, sending uh, samples between uh, test sites that are located in different states or countries. Um, to date, over 100 different cannabinoids and their breakdown products have been reported in the literature, um, but the analyte scope of typical routine testing methods uh, is usually limited to the major cannabinoids, including CBD, CBDA, THC and THCA, and uh, other neutral or acidic cannabinoids. The most widespread techniques employed for analysis of cannabinoids in biological matrices are uh, high-performance liquid chromatography with UV spectrophotometric detection or gas chromatography with flame ionization detection. Both LC and GC technique can be, can be also uh, operated with highly sensitive and selective mass spectrometric detection. Uh, liquid chromatography-based methods allow determination of both neutral and acidic analytes, which is uh, difficult with uh, GC methods due to uh, thermally induced decomposition of acidic cannabinoids uh, to their uh, neutral forms during injection to the GC system. Uh, here are some points that uh, were considered when scoping out our cannabinoid methods that uh, was, was to be used in our laboratories. We wanted to be able to determine both neutral and acidic compounds, and therefore we decided to use a LC-based approach. Um, using LC uh, methodology, the total content of part particle analyte can be calculated by summing up concentration of neutral and acidic form uh, while multiplying the latter result by uh, molecular weight conversion factor. It was also important to report as low analyte concentrations as possible and include the option to report on dry weight uh, basis, which is a legal requirement for the determination of total THC in a hemp plant material. Another point considered was the need for accurate uh, quantification in isolate materials with purity close to 100%. Uh, this may be challenging if using inappropriate calibration approaches. Um, additional challenge was that, that we had to deal with was analysis of micro-encapsulated materials. Um, such samples uh, contain a li lipophilic carrier that uh, contains cannabinoids and is encapsulated in protein or polysaccharide-based based, uh, uh, microcapsules uh, to make it, for example, dispersible in water, prolong the shelf life, or increase the bioavailability. And for these samples, optimized extraction procedures need to be used to recover the target analyte. Uh, at Eurofins, we developed a method for analysis of cannabinoids that was granted AOAC official method status. 
Uh, this method was further expanded to cover analysis of 16 cannabinoids in a range of sample types and to include dry weight determination for plant materials. The method is compliant with applicable AOAC international standard method performance requirements and uh, was also ISO 17025 accredited uh, at multiple Eurofins laboratories. Um, the liquid chromatography portion of the method is compatible with mass spectrometric detection and can be used as a backup option for cases when selectivity and sensitivity of the UV detector is not sufficient. Uh, the LC-MS configuration uh, allows us to achieve uh, limits of quantification at or below low parts per million concentration, uh, even in the most complex sample. Residual solvents uh, represent byproducts of the extraction processes that are used to isolate oil, cannabinoids, and other components uh, from the hemp plant material. The extraction techniques used in uh, you know, current modern uh, current hemp industry employs ethanol, hydrocarbons such as propane and butane, as well as supercritical carbon dioxide. Uh, each of these uh, solvents or extraction media have uh, their pros and cons. Uh, the contamination of ingredient and finished products with residual solvents is due to incomplete removal of the extraction medium. Uh, the samples may not contain only the original solvents used for the extraction, but also uh, other chemicals that may be present as impurities in the extraction medium itself. Um, considering relatively high volatility of these compounds, uh, headspace gas chromatography with mass spectrometric detection is the gold standard approach to analysis of these contaminants. Uh, pesticides are used uh, to protect hemp crops from pests and diseases. Contamination of plants with pesticides may occur not only due to non-optimal direct application, but also due to uptake of pesticides from soil, as, as mentioned already. Uh, modern pesticides are relatively safe and degrade rapidly. However, uh, contaminated soil may contain highly toxic persistent compounds, use of which has been banned many years ago, and therefore it's appropriate to employ multi-residue methods with large analyte scope. It is important to know that certain pesticides cannot be included in multi-residue multi methods and uh, require dedicated analysis protocols. Uh, this is typically due to the distinct physical chemical properties of these compounds. Uh, the list of targeted compounds to be monitored in uh, samples should be based on uh, results of risk assessment and of course include pesticides that are regulated by applicable state laws. Uh, due to low target levels and complexity of test matrices, uh, pesticide residue analysis uh, represents a relatively challenging task and requires modern analytical approaches, uh, which are based on GCMS and LCMS techniques. Uh, the method uh, that is used in our laboratories allows analysis of more than 500 compounds and covers deregulated pesticides uh, and also allows you know, reporting uh, select subset of analytes uh, that can be uh, customized by the client. Mycotoxins are of, are of concern with regard to the uh, toxicity and relatively high stability. Uh, the two of the primary types of mycotoxins that are associated with hemp plants are eflatoxins and ocratoxins. Uh, these compounds may contaminate uh, hemp crops before, during, and even after their harvest. Um, and LCMS or LC with fluorescence detection are usually used in this testing. It should be noted that more and more st states require mycotoxins testing to be included uh, on the product certificates of analysis. Another group of contaminants uh, to be tested are heavy metals. Uh, these can enter the plant as a consequence of uptake uh, from soil. Um, contamination uh, may also be associated with use of poor quality fertilizers containing these pollutants or uh, with inadequate uh, manufacturing practices. Uh, the usual suspects in this case are arsenic, cadmium, lead, and mercury. Uh, additionally, testing of nickel, cobalt, and chromium is of interest, uh, especially in skincare and cosmetic products. 
The typical heavy metal analysis uh, workflows are based on ICPMS technique, uh, which stands for inductively, inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry. Um, this approach allows determination of heavy metals uh, down to low PPV levels, even in highly complex samples. Uh, terpenes are a major group of phytochemicals that are responsible for flavor and uh, aromatic profile characteristic to different hemp varieties. Uh, terpenes are also expected to have some positive health effects, although there is not much, uh, uh, there's only limited knowledge uh, on their uh, biological activities. Uh, from the finished product perspective, the presence of terpenes is particularly important in items that lack their own uh, aroma. Um, uh, sorry. Finished hemp products are also frequently added with uh, terpenes that are isolated from other uh, plant sources. Terpenes are much more volatile compared to uh, cannabinoids and for this type of compounds, GC with flame ionization detector or MS detection uh, is the preferred analytic technique. The method used in our laboratories allows simultaneous analysis of over 40 different terpenes using Headspace GCMS technique. Uh, and the method covers compounds dominant in hemp, but also other, uh, uh, other terpenes. This concludes the overview of important analytes, uh, and let's switch gears now and talk about the method validation. Each assay to be used for testing needs to be demonstrated uh, suitable for its intended use. Um, this is accomplished through validation of the method and involves evaluation of several validation parameters in relevant samples. Uh, the main validation parameters are selectivity, limit of quantification, accuracy and precision, and robustness. Uh, the parameters are evaluated and determined uh, experimentally. So let's go through uh, these in more detail. Selectivity of the method is the ability to determine target compounds in the presence of other components of the sample. Uh, LOQ is the lowest amount of the target compound that can be reliably quantified. Uh, accuracy documents how close uh, uh, is the result generated by the method to the real content uh, in the sample and uh, precision of the method, uh, which is often expressed as a relative standard deviation, shows how close are the results of repeated tests performed uh, on an identical sample. Finally, robustness is a measure of how the generated results affect, are affected by small deviations from the method procedure. Um, of course, depending on the actual performance of the method, we can obtain different results. If we imagine that the sample testing is shooting at the target, which has the real concentration of the analyte in the very middle, there may be several outcomes of repeated testing. Uh, the results of poorly performing method with unacceptable accuracy and precision will be dispersed and far from the middle. Uh, on the other hand, the method with good performance will provide narrow range of results close to the middle of the target. Um, method validation process is used to ensure methods will provide correct results that are within acceptable range. Uh, the technical competence of laboratories uh, in analytical testing is independently documented by accreditation to ISO standard 17025. Uh, the accreditation is granted to specific uh, test methods and the by, by the national uh, accreditation body based on periodical evaluation of the laboratory. Uh, the laboratory accreditation is recognized at international level and ensures high standard of processes and documentation. It also ensures validity and suitability of methods uh, and equipment to be used in testing and also traceability of measurements and calibrations to applicable national and uh, international standards. Uh, I would say that choosing an accredited uh, laboratory for testing of your product brings additional confidence uh, when it comes to the quality of the results. Uh, this was my last slide. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your kind attention. That completes the presentations for our webinar today. Thank you to Laura and Mariella Mukash for sharing your expertise and thank you everyone for attending.